Hi, and welcome to, I think, number six of the uh, Blueprint Blethers. Um, here with Scott Riddle and Chris Reed, um, two of our game development managers. Um, and for the next wee while, we're going to talk about the principles of play and um, the rugby cog, which is part of our uh, Blueprint. So welcome again, gents. Good to have you on, as always. This is becoming a bit of a Wednesday morning fixture. That's when we record it, by the way. So, um, yeah, we're going to talk about the um, the kind of rugby aspect of the blueprint. Now, this is the old technical blueprint. was very much focused around this uh, rugby model and the principles of play. So, for those of you just listening, the principles of play, it's a cycle of how the game works through contest to possession, go forward, support, continuity, to apply pressure, which then either arises in a score or uh, the cycle continues again until you do so or lose possession. So, we're going to just talk about how that fits in terms of the blueprint, how some of the games help to kind of bring that out, and then also going to be a bit of a deep dive into kind of the attack and the defence. So, as you mentioned, it was a big part of the old blueprint, and I think um, the current blueprint, we've actually looked at some of the skills and the coaching skills and the environmental stuff that, that sits around it, but we were just chatting in the office, and we think it's still a really important part to get through, so this is why we picked it for our topic today. So... Chris, when you are coaching, how do you use the principles of play to shape content, kind of like priorities and things like that? Because rugby is a big game, there's a lot going on. And when for community coaches, we tend to only coach for a couple hours, three hours tops a week. So have you ever used the principles of play as a bit of a guide for anything? I think you probably use them in every session. Yeah. You maybe don't list them and write them down of what you're actually doing, but you use them in every session. So you, you, you'll have a contestant, and even if it's just a tap to play or however you want to do it, touch games, you'll have a contest possession in some way, shape or form. Mm -hmm. But you work through that whole cycle, whether you're working in defence, whether you're working in attack, just skills, you'll work through the cycle of it all and it, without listing them. So yeah, I would yeah. say you use them all in every session that you do. Mm -hmm. And Scott, you've been doing loads of work on the principles of play with um, some teachers in the lead up to schools week. Um, it's been positive. So how have they kind of found this principle? Because again, you mentioned it's maybe as rugby coaches, so we don't necessarily kind of like overtly talk about, but you've obviously been doing a lot of work around it with teachers. Yeah, I think from a, from a game development point of view, where we would look to you know, differentiate between coaching the game and potentially teaching the game to to new players or maybe maybe coaches who aren't maybe as necessarily familiar with the game itself. Um, but for me, like the, the principles of play would would be a good a great starting point for the game to be broken down into coachable or 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 teachable elements, if teachable is a word. Teachable is a word, isn't it? Is yeah. So um and then actually further down the line having that ability to manipulate the principles of play to aid learning. Mm -hmm. So if we're working with a group of players who are who are struggling because they're maybe not able to get go forward or um, the knock on effect of that would be that it's very difficult for their support play to, to be in the game, which doesn't allow continuity. How can, can we as coaches be able to to help them out with with gaining go forward so um an example might be that uh, players are always stopping and placing the ball on the deck uh, so we might look to introduce two or three touches and then maybe have a, a little focus that within one second they can offload to a player who's a meter and a half away so ensuring close support and helping out with continuity and then I suppose it's then just once we've got those sort of parameters in place where where we know that that'll have enough of an effect on the defence to influence space for the attack to manipulate and, and ultimately, you know, you know, get through and hopefully score um, is, is what I'm actually quite interested in. Excellent. And to kind of, I suppose, supplement the principles of play, we've got these rugby cogs, so on the screen we've got our attack model and the kind of the key term is how to beat the defence. So we talked about go forward. Go forward skills are running, evasive running. It's a running, passing, kicking is a massive one as well. And we've designed the blueprint games to kind of really bring out those three go forward elements. But how to beat the defence. We've got the defensive model. And again, the snappy tagline is how to get the ball back or to the aim of defence. 
we sometimes talk to coaches like, oh, it's to stop the attack from scoring. But being a bit more adventurous, we like to think of it actually, let's get the ball back for ourselves, then have the opportunity then to transition and then attack. We've got rugby speed up there as a cog. And as we were talking just before the webinar started, you'd rather play against a team that was slow to think, slow to act, wouldn't you? So what does rugby speed look like and things like that? Yeah, I think for, I think rugby speed is, is the principle that you because when are, when are players going to enjoy it most? Mm -hmm. Most of them will enjoy, it, especially the younger age groups I work with. It they enjoy playing at speed, playing at tempo, getting the ball moving, getting running. And I think so. The more we put rugby speed in there, yes, we can always talk about it. It's, it, it allows us to score. It creates pressure. But actually, if you look at it purely engagement enjoyment level playing rugby at speed, getting the ball in play as much as you possibly can, get as many touches in the ball as you possibly can. Mm -hmm. That's what's going to engage young people. And I think that's that's why for me it's so important in everything we do. Definitely. Yeah, I think I was as Chris was uh, speaking there, I was just thinking about, you know, how we might coach rugby speed. Um and it, it might be, you know, more of a philosophy that we, we try and do things at speed and an urgency. So We'll go into a wee bit more detail in a second when we, we look at the attack and the defence focuses. Um, but actually, you know, having strap lines, for example, like the floor is lava for the ball. You know, if, if the ball's on the deck for too long, it's going to melt. Um, ultimately, gives the defence time. Um, and then just as a, a wee side note, I think that we have to remember that the principles of play apply to the defence as well as the attack. So for each of the you know instances up there so contest possession go forward support continuity apply pressure score prevent score it's you know a yin and yang approach um, and it's that that's what makes it such a such a good game to to be involved in if you go support with connection which is your support and your continuity is after contest how well you kind of reset and fold to then be able to go forward that applies pressure doesn't it so it's really good with that a couple of cogs to also talk about one of the things that I notice when I go out and watch coaching is that players want to work is always communication, but we've, we've been a bit more specific and we've got scan, talk, listen, and actually how well as coaches we know and afford the opportunities for players to, to allow them to give them the time to scan, especially when learning a game, it's quite hard to see things going on in real time. So can we afford players a bit more time to scan? How are they going to, what sort of things are they saying to each other to communicate, right? There's the space, there's that defender there's that opportunity but also listening isn't it like it, the receipt like there's no point in talking unless someone's receiving that information yeah I think if you look at how often players will be shouting for the ball but the player inside isn't listening they're busy watching inside yeah. them and so they don't see it but I think the scanning is a really interesting one especially from my coaching perspective is that how do we coach and it, how do we coach scanning how do we help players understand what scanning really means and I think it's, it's those questioning skills that you have as a coach to go what are you seeing how did you, what did you feel Wh where was the space that you saw because mm -hmm. actually what I see might be, see might be something different so there's key coaching skills within that that will help us develop players to scan because it's, it's a really tough thing to, to put into practice definitely yeah it's like that activity on the ball and then off the ball because there's only ever one player on the ball at a time in the game and that's then 29 others quick maths that are off the ball who could be who could be you know feeding information I think it's um it's how we like support the players as well where we give them maybe some buzzwords or some little phrases that that they can then associate with space wide or what our support players are saying to us are they saying lift are they saying pop are they saying uh keep keep going you know or place and go you know these these things that can ultimately like help our go forward and you know for that to coin that old expression like play what's in front of you as well uh, how one one for both of you how do, how do you guys coach scanning because it's something that we expect our players to do but we always talk about in uh, in coaching that sometimes needs to exaggerate a problem to kind of bring it to players attention but any kind of tips that you've used for like really getting quite deliberate about coaching the scanning aspect probably freeze frame as a, as a coach tool just what, what's that done to, what does that do to the players so for you literally stop the game yeah so when it and let them have a look at where the space is and then start it again yeah so, so or stop it and allow one side to reorganize two seconds to reorganize so the attack might be reorganized but freeze frame for me works brilliantly well for letting players see where the space is if you if you stop it at the right time before they've made a decision, 
they can then look, okay, and then that can influence the decision. Or once they've made it, rewind it back and go, okay, everybody back to where you were. Let's see where we go from there. And I think as a scanning tool, it just changes how they start looking at the game because, oh, I can look over there now. Brilliant, because you give them the time to do it and, and set it up. So, yeah, for me, freeze frame is probably one of the tools I use most to help players understand where the space is and where scanning works. Yeah, for me, um, like definitely agree with what Chris is saying. Um, I think some players need a wee bit more of a a nudge to be able to see space, for example. So using you know different coloured bibs in a defensive line where it's red, green, red, green, red, green, and if if two greens ever get together, then you can attack that space. So it's like the visual aid, um, maybe having players in the backfield wearing different colours as well so the, the sort of the the attack can use them as markers potentially or if we've attacked wide um, and and for example the, maybe one of the backfield players have been involved in that breakdown then you know they're not they're not there and they're in a really bright bib for example um, would be a good way to sort of you know, bring it to life a wee bit more potentially. And that was the principle behind Skyball, wasn't it? That in order to get players to learn how to scan space down a backfield, space is quite a conceptual thing if you don't know what space is to you. So by actually by putting two visible targets, i.e. your teammates, who are out offside, that was a great way of doing it. And then coupled with freeze frame, you've got some real tools. So I think the key thing is, there, is it affording time to scan? Sometimes we assume that players can see everything in real time. And I like that one you said, at each breakdown, maybe pausing for three to four seconds and allowing one team just to move, like freeze the defence, allow the attack go. If you could stand anywhere, where would it be right now? Yeah. And it gets them to look and act. I think that's quite a cool thing. Um, and the final cog we got there, which runs through the whole blueprint, is Scots. So they're self-organised, creative, optimistic, tenacious and selfless skills. If players can do that, they're going to stand them in great, a great place to kind of work on the other rugby cog. So what we'll do now, we're going to just do a bit of a deeper dive into kind of the attack cog and the defence one. So... This is new for the um, this blueprint, and attack. We wanted to be a bit more kind of a principle based um, in terms of like what are the kind of like the big rocks we want to go for. So I'll just read them out, and then I'll just ask the guys kind of like which ones really speaks to you. So as we mentioned before, attack is all about beating the defence. Okay, um, ultimately it's the score, but depending where you're on the pitch, so how can we beat the defence in that particular phase of aspect, and then you do that enough times, so then you want to score, right? So we've got, first of all, find the best space. Okay, and I like, I like the freedom behind that. Find the best space. Now that, that might be wide, it might be through, it might be close to the breakdown, it might be kicking over. Stress the defence as well. How do we kind of manipulate defence to push and pull and make sure they kind of like get them in places where there's going to be less numbers. Continuity. We talked about a quick game with support. It's really hard to defend. Um, Look at how when fans at the weekend play their power game, they do it with support. So as soon as a couple of people have to make a tackle, that next one is really in there. And it's, we would talk about how hard it must be to play against when it's done like that. Speed is a big thing, rugby speed. Then staying connected as well. You can't really have continuity unless you've got this set up here. People are out to bounce off. So Chris, yeah, which which of those really speaks to you and how, how do you go around coaching some of these aspects? I suppose... It, a lot of it comes down to your own philosophy as a coach, doesn't it? And I think, so for me, rugby speed is, is the key principle and all. I think if, if we can get the speed of the game up, ball in play time, speed of, speed of breakdown, speed of offload, speed of decision making, speed of organisation, you then stress defenders. You then stretch and push the defence. Uh, I, think, I think also beating the defence is also, I think finding the best space is really important. And I look at the Scotland attack at the weekend from the, from the mall inside their 22. They set up for the kick, but they found the best space because they did a kick past the touchline and, fed, and they were all of a sudden they were 50, yards, 50 metres up the pitch. So I think, it, I think finding the best space is also really important, not saying you can only do this in this area of the pitch, how we, they get organised. But if rugby speed is the speed of thought to go, actually, this is the best option. So I think for me, rugby speed is a key principle, but then <coughs> linked to finding the best space. It's interesting what you say, because on that mall where Finn did a cross kick and there was a patted back down, if you take away the lines and the posts, if the defence were in that shape, you'd do that anyway, wouldn't you? If you had that few people in the front line, maybe a few more people towards, I think it was the left touch line, waiting to clear the box kick. So if you take away all the lines and the pitch, 
the picture is actually that's a pretty obvious option. And I think sometimes as coaches we get a bit, especially at youth level where the pressure shouldn't be on, we should be exploring the impossible, I think is a tagline that we're looking to use. That, yeah, the best space is just what's in front of you. And that was a really good example of it. And I was at the game, it was a heart and mouth moment because I was right on the edge. It was, it was good. No, yeah, it was a, a cracking game um, at the weekend. Just for, for me, like staying connected is, is a big one. Um, like mentioned before, that there's only one player on the ball at the time. Um, the connection aspect would be, you know, inside support, outside support, maybe a second layer um, of attack, maybe a third layer of attack. And just like where it could be as simple as, you know, forwards understanding what the backs are trying to do, um, backs understanding the, the forward skill set potentially. Um, Should we even look at attackers as one holistic unit? Yeah, I think so. I think all our players are different though, but and having that, you know, deeper understanding, the deeper connection, you know, on a from an off field point of view, it can can really help you when when the pressure's on and and decisions are having to make be made when you know the, the bombs are going off and in attack and the defense is trying to ultimately put you under pressure. So, like those connections and I think for, from a you know skill set um, focus, the ability to have like the variety of pass, for example, to throw a miss pass or to to tug, you know, a a, a soft pass back to a player, mm -hmm. um, or you know, give an inside ball under pressure, or you know, throw you know a, a tunnel ball through across a player and having the trust to you know put your hands up as the ball's going across you, for example, you know, there's there's so Go much. Give a tunnel to ball it. quickly. What's a tunnel ball oh, for those who don't know? A tunnel ball would be a sort of a, a player running a down line um, towards having, the ball carrier yeah towards mm. the ball carrier and then having an option to to hit a short line but you're essentially running a down like running a, a sort of PB shape um, and then playing it across the front of a player to another player um, yeah I think then you know having that connected approach where our, our back three are able to to work their way into a game for example so um, if, if we're playing, you know, open, the winger from that short side is having some real trust to to go and look for inside options, and it's, you know, have, having that work off the ball would, would be something, you know, is, is really interesting to sort of analyse a bit. I think in its purest terms, isn't it? Staying connected just stresses defenders because if I'm a defender and the ball player has more than one option, then already as a defender I'm like, so they can run or pass, and I don't really know where they're going to pass because options around it and that takes away my certainty to then go forward and make a decision so all these things are interconnected aren't they and uh, for me I, I love to find the best space the, if a good attack will be able to manipulate space anywhere and we talk about the um, go forward this lends itself to really understanding the run pass kick options and we talked about it in our previous brother with Dodzi that kicking is such an important skill because if we limit ourselves to the skills to only develop so sorry to kind of attack short or wide spaces and maybe nothing in between them. we're doing ourselves out of a opportunity to maybe get to the best space which might be or the green grass or astroturf that sits behind but it's how we how we sort of like review and reflect as well yeah, yeah, you can yeah. ask as chris was saying using freeze frame simply like pausing a session and asking where is the best space right now you know it's maybe a wee bit of a cliche question but you know the game is so fluid and there's there's so much so many moving parts that you know again like the players have to make decisions based on maybe what they've experienced success in previously so have we then you know allowed them freedom in training to explore that um, and do they have confidence in and actually or the the capability to attack that best space but and as we as coaches do we allow them the creativity and the opportunity to practice it make mistakes. and make mistakes mm. and I think I, I was at a coaching conference a good few years ago and, and they, they talked about rugby just be or team sports being very simple is that you see the space talk about the space get the ball to the space but you need everybody to see the same picture so it's all very well you're you're 10 seeing the space and putting the kick in but if the winger doesn't see the space at the same time then they don't see it so as coaches can we set up scenarios where players have the opportunity to all see the same space mm -hmm. so it, so it's great that certain players will see it but you 
ultimately, as a coach, you want everybody to see that space and be able to manipulate and get the ball to it. I think going back to the scanning we spoke about earlier, that's so key for me is, is how do we get everybody to see at least two, three, four, five players at the same time seeing the space. So you run your down lines, but who do you give the ball to? Who calls for the ball? Because the space is going to be in front of one of those individuals. Sort of idea. We talked about in step how we can use different zones on a pitch, maybe push the attention towards a certain space if that's a behaviour you want to see. So we talked about these wide channel games, that how you move a ball from channel to channel, it automatically gets the players looking at where the opportunity is either there or over there, and you either kick pass or pass towards it. And some training tips, it can be really useful for that. Um, so the attack, I mean, we could do a full course on that, and there'll be bits and pieces we'll drip feed um, as we go over the kind of more blethers. But um, defence is obviously a really exciting part of the game. Um and again, it, same kind of principle that we've got five elements that we we're going to talk about quickly. So first of all is the go forward element, a defence that can take away time and space from an attack. Thinking, a thinking time as well, that is, is a really, can be really effective. Um, low tackles, so safe tackles, getting place to the ground as quickly as possible to create a contest of possession to get the ball back is ultimately what we want to try and do. Um, Comp yeah, and that basically just allows us to compete for the ball. I, if the whole tagline is to get the ball back, then we want to have those opportunities. And there's a loads of different ways to get the ball back, isn't there? We can explore that about how we can get defence to be creative. Back in the game, you can't do anything when you're on the floor in the laws of rugby union. So once we've made a tackle, how can we get back up into a position to then go again and be the threat? And this is quite a creative one. People, we usually think of defence being quite systematic and quite dogmatic in terms of like you must do this when or you must go up here but actually we're seeing a lot more kind of like selling space and maybe sitting and holding and luring attack into traps but that being the threat changing line speed you've seen nines across the world doing that faf the clerk taking that running line and flying out the line and um not being connected is a big thing so scott obviously sevens the massive massive part of it is the defensive element which of these really speaks to you and which one and how would you go around coaching it? Yeah, I think um you know, both an attack and defence is from a like coaching tool is the ability to sort of create cycles, um, where we would maybe look to have some principles in place that, you know, one would have a knock on effect and if we don't achieve what we do, we go back to the start of a cycle and it can be quite a good way to sort of up or, or teach the players you know what, what we're looking to achieve and and for me like I'm I'm really interested in like competing for the ball so if we can make an effective tackle provides opportunities to maybe either rip or jackal um, or intercept and or maybe slow the ball down which buys time for our team to get back in the game um, so there's sort of these selfless acts of players who will you know have that skill set that they might look to get their hands on the ball at the breakdown um, or, or counter ruck, which then slows the opposition ball down and allows our team to maybe get a little bit more time to fold and get connected and then buy another metre of width, um, which allows the opportunity to go forward. I realise I'm stealing quite a, the, a lot of these. You've picked uh, all of them, Scott. I, I, haven't, I haven't mentioned <laughs> be the threat. I'm leaving one for Chris to speak about. Right. But Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> Again, like uh, Chris yeah. stole a few from Attack, and he was he was saying they are very much interlinked. But um, like competing for ball, the intercept is a really interesting one for me. Like, I like that because that is all, that's the easiest way to get the ball back, and it's so I mean it's indefensible. You yeah. saw, unfortunately, Thomas Ramos. I know we're we're trying to sort of influence the attack to maybe force their hand into making a decision that they're. Maybe not really wanting to. So you're going to be the threat now as well. No, I'm not. I'm not, I'm not <laughs> going to be the threat. But um, like that cat and mouse side of things, if you maybe show a little bit um, further for further go forward in the uh, in the defensive line, then it might influence a decision. But then you know, hopefully we can create players that can you know, problem solve in the moment and have you know options in and around them that they can maybe exploit that as well. Do you, do you think there's players that are just naturally good defenders? So spe especially in the wider channel, thinking, you know, if we think about these areas here, there are some very good defenders. And I'm looking, thinking about some of the younger players that we come across that are actually very good at reading the game and understanding when to make decisions. That you go for the intercepts, a really good one. So, so we were chatting yesterday with Chris Patterson, weren't we? 
you can be a good tackler, but not necessarily a good defender. So good defense is all about under, understanding space, understanding speed of ball, and actually where to position yourself. And yeah, and and who you're working with as yeah, well. Yeah, so yeah. who are the players around you? So, um, like understanding if you're working with a slower player inside you, you know, you, you can't just be that maverick that you're going to fly out the line and make it all about yourself. So we're back into like selflessness, I suppose, in in a defensive line. Um, Recognise what the attacker have. Like sometimes you find, without being disparaging to tight forwards, maybe a, a prop at first, see if having to throw a longer pass. A good defender might recognise that and think, actually, there's an opportunity to get the ball back. Yeah, it happens to tens as well. I'm not being just picking on the I tight forwards. Yeah, I think like that, like physical element, you yeah. know, of like agility, balance, coordination, you know, when... You know, we'd probably look to take the space while the ball's in the air and um, would be maybe a, a coaching point that we could focus on. And, and that covers quite a lot of things. So how wide is the attack looking to set up on us? The ball might be in the air for a, a little bit longer where we can take a little bit more space. But Or we could look at, you know, go and then balance and then go again into the tackle and how long we sort of spend in each of those areas. So if we're going, would be go forward. I've st stolen another one there. Um leave him be the threat for Chris but you know the, the balance side of things would be our decision making our reading the attacker's body language um what support options they might have and maybe balance might allow time for our defenders to connect in and around us mm -hmm. and then our goal is that decision to make a tackle and you know even where like low, low tackles in there might be a decision making aspect of of what type of tackle we're looking to uh, make based on who's carrying the ball, you know, what area of the field are we in and what players are around us. And I think the blueprint games reflect this, these kind of things because all the blueprint games have a, an attack focus, but more importantly also a defence focus that so we really want to create in each of these games an opportunity for the defence to get the ball back. So um, have a look through the games, I think is the big thing to see what they are. Now, coaching defence, when we usually when we go into coaching sessions, we always focus on like how we make the attack better, but any tips that you've got like in games, how do we bring your focus to defence? How do we reward defence? What sort of things would you put in place into a game? What, kind of, what sort of conditions? I suppose some of the simple conditions are if you stop two or three passes, then you get the ball back. Yeah, if, like you, if you get a If you get a shoulder contact on the hip, so you get a really good low tackle technique hit, then you can get, you can get the ball back, Even just touch, but it's, it's not like full contact, but if you get in a really good position, then you, you can get the ball back. A lot of it is, we'll talk a lot about winning the race and, and, and defence getting organised to win the race, get organised quicker, faster, and then you get off the line and we'll reward sometimes if the team get organised quicker than the attack and we'll, it will, we'll just call turnover and the, the defence get the ball. So it's more about the organisational side of it and it, and it allows, puts a bit of incentive for the defence to get organised a little bit quicker. Uh, and that works quite well for us. I like the one about giving him certain parameters to get the ball back. So we used to put one, like if you get to the first receiver, hey, we want this first receiver to move the ball potentially, but yeah, um, we do another one where if you can get four hands to a touch, shows that you've stayed connected and then got in. You're a big fan on like what pe we can do at the breakdown in touch games, kind of reward the defence. What sort of things have you seen that really work to kind of encourage the defence to get the ball back in that aspect? Yeah, I think it doesn't always have to be like contact as yeah, well so yeah. we don't need to be you know flying into each other um a little one sort of tried recently was uh the tackler has to do a pancake um after they've made a what's a pancake a pancake on your belly on your back on your belly and up and then um to try and introduce like sort of a decision making element for competing for ball if um the attack was able to put a player over um to, to play the ball away, if I d if the next defender could drop to a knee before that attack player was in place, then they would get a turnover. So I'm trying to think about a conscious decision of when to go in and compete or or when to stay out or when to fold. Um, you, you could say it's two players, maybe, if we, if we might look to, to, to make the defence put more into a breakdown. Um, but, yeah, I like the, the sort of process elements and rewarding the defence for getting the ball back and, and give them the ball back or yeah I think it's definitely an area we can like tinker with and you make defences better you make attacks better 
because they have to be more skillful to beat them. But again, guys, great having you on. Another great Wednesday morning blethering about the blueprints. Um, check out the blueprint games. Have uh, All these um, slides will be available to you soon. And uh, yeah, thanks for uh, watching and we'll catch up with you on the next blether.